And Matt has an extremely interesting background. Matt is a veteran. He, uh, I think you did two terms in Afghanistan, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, at the end of the second of which, he was medevaced out of, uh, out of the country. So he was severely, uh, severely injured. Um, he then went through the normal medical process to try to heal, uh, and he found that in his case, it was virtually killing him. So in, in connection with that, one of the things he's done is he has actually moved to Colorado specifically to have access to a broader array of cannabis products, which he has used very successfully to heal himself. And he is now, through his organization, which is called Veterans for Natural Rights, he is now helping other vets to follow the same path. So he will speak specifically about how cannabis has been very helpful for uh, veterans such as himself, other people suffering from PTSD, other medical is issues. So my name is Matthew Kale. I'm the uh, executive director of uh, Veterans for Natural Rights. Um, we're a veterans advocacy organization on the front range. We build communities where veterans can heal, find their voice, and then change the world. Our credo is pretty simple, freedom equally for everyone. We represent a natural rights position on the Constitution before the legislature, and that's to protect personal freedom and individual liberties in America. Um, we do this because we swore an oath uh, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. It's our enlistment oath. Uh, no one has ever relieved me of that oath, and I don't think anybody's relieved any other veteran from that oath either. So they, they trained us to carry flags through thick and thin, um, fire and brimstone. And now that we are back here in the States, pounding our own swords to plowshares, uh, we still carry that flag, and that, that flag is freedom. Natural rights are often listed as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness if you're talking to Jefferson, or life, liberty, and property if you're talking to Locke. But naturally from property comes tr the right to trade, trade that property. Um, but there's one more natural right that's mentioned in the Declaration of Independence that's often overlooked, and that's equality under the law. Um, the founders were pretty clever, though, and, and they understood that an individual's freedoms were not limited by our founding documents, but rather its purpose was to limit the agency of government to do anything about those freedoms. The Ninth Amendment was specifically to guarantee additional rights not delineated in the Constitution. <clears throat> One of our founders, Benjamin Rush, he was a physician, and even he knew that the medical profession would soon become an instrument of extortion for the people of America. So he proposed actually protecting our medical freedoms in the Constitution with an amendment uh, that never actually uh, got put down there. So um, Hippocrates, the founder of Western medicine uh, and the originator of the Hippocratic Oath, uh, first do no harm. First do no harm, uh, and he famously said, if you're not your own doctor, you're a fool. And for that reason and the other reasons I mentioned, we believe that medical freedom and cognitive liberty are the birthrights of every single American, not just veterans. But we are, of course, here to fight for your freedoms too. And sometimes when we're sent into unjust wars, fighting for dubious objectives, we come back with PTSD. The Japanese have a technique called kintsukoroi. I'm totally mangling that, sorry about that. Kintsukoroi. It means to repair with gold. And it's the art of repairing pottery with gold with the understanding that the piece is even more beautiful for having been broken. And in a very real way, veterans represent the cracks in a society that have been damaged by endless cycles of war. We're fighting a lot out there. And they're sending us back out and back out and back out. Most of these wars, as we all know, um, they're not fought really for the safety or, or good of the American people. Um, and they're done for special interests. But we believe that if we can heal the veteran, then possibly we might be able to heal the world. <clears throat> so um, we are undoubtedly the poster children for the phenomenon of PTSD in America right now. Uh, but it's really our job now that we've gone over and, and had to be exposed to all this stuff uh, to bring attention to the fact that PTSD is not just a veteran issue. This is, this is an American issue. This, this is a worldwide issue. And um, you may have heard that 22 veterans a day commit suicide. That's true. 
But what most people haven't heard is that 121 civilians in the general population commit suicide too. They have PTSD also. It's not a veteran problem. This is all over the United States. So um, Dr. Gabor Mate, he's probably the, the leading addictionologist uh, or addiction specialist in the world. And uh, he says that undiagnosed trauma is the number one predictor of addiction. And what's one of the leading problems with treating PTSD? It's over medication. I myself, I was on 160 milligrams of Oxycontin a day, uh, 60 milligrams of Roxycodone for breakthrough pain, two milligrams of Xanax uh, a day, and 90 milligrams of Valium every single day. Any physician can tell you this is not a good idea. This is not a good idea for, for anyone to be on these kind of drugs uh, in that sort of combination. But yet that's exactly what they do to us. Uh, thankfully, that only lasted uh, through the medevac, and uh, afterwards, you know, they put me on different drugs, but I continued to circle the drain for a very long time, uh, several years after I got out. So, when talking about these high levels of medication, um, you know, we're losing 71,614 people a year, at least last year, to overdose. 71,000. That's more people than died in the Vietnam War. Uh, it's, it's a massive number. And we're losing 44,965 people a year to suicide. So combine those two numbers together. Um, oh, this is a, a little known fact. For every successful suicide, there's 25 attempts. This is huge. This is a serious problem in America. So if you add those numbers up, you get 116,579 people who are dying in America, at least last year, dying because of what is essentially the same problem, and that's trauma, undiagnosed trauma. Find me one person that overdoses on a drug or one person that commits suicide by firearm or even hanging themselves or, or, or taking medicines that doesn't have trauma. I, I challenge anybody to find me one. Um, they're not out there. But instead, we throw a lot of them in jail, uh, you know, heaping trauma upon trauma and uh, just perpetuating the cycle. Studies have shown about a 75% reduction in uh, PTSD scores. CAPS is the, the gold standard for measuring PTSD uh, in the, the psychiatric community. And there is a 75% reduction in CAP scores when patients use cannabis. That's a huge number. That is not statistically insignificant. That is hugely significant. And still, they are doing their best to prevent any kind of research on uh, cannabis for PTSD. In 2014 is when I really got my introduction to um, the political process when I started trying to help Sue Sisley of Arizona get $2.1 million to fund a landmark uh, triple-blind uh, placebo-controlled trial for cannabis and veterans with PTSD. She got that grant that year, and her study's now underway. We're just waiting on the results here in, in Colorado. But unfortunately, we really can't afford to wait. Veterans and civilians alike are dying right now, every single day. And people need access today, if not yesterday. So I filed a lawsuit in 2015 to force the state to recognize PTSD as a covered condition under our medical marijuana laws. And in 2017, we finally got a few sponsors for a bill called SB 1717, Allow Medical Marijuana for Stress Disorders. And it was signed into law on June 5th, 2017, and PTSD is now a covered condition for medical marijuana in the state of Colorado. Thank you. Um, honestly, uh, most of the time I'm speaking to a cannabis crowd, um, but if we're gonna stop 116,500 deaths a year from suicide and overdose, we can't really afford to leave any stones unturned. And there's a lot of other uh, treatments out there. They're not all just cannabis. Uh, so uh, this slide here is, uh, is about MDMA. And, and I personally, I want to end the drug war in its, its entirety. There's, there's not a single part of it that needs to still remain up. We need to take it apart piece by piece. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about civil asset forfeiture, we're talking about the over-incarceration rates, or if we're talking about uh, Schedule One for any drug. 
there's no drug out there in existence that we cannot find a use for. And just because we haven't found one yet doesn't mean it's not out there. Um, so clinical trials for MDMA and PTSD, they're actually taking place in Boulder right now. They're in phase three. That's like the last phase. They're almost ready. They're almost done to approve it for treating PTSD. And um, I got to say, it's probably one of the best treatments out there. Uh, they've found, uh, you see here on this slide, down at the bottom, 83%. 83% of participants were no longer even qualified as a PTSD patient after two months of therapy. Their CAF scores dropped so low, they no longer were PTSD patients, really. Um, so, and then they came back and they, they tested them um, 3.8 years later. 3.8 years later, and what they had found, actually, you see over here on, on the right-hand side, their scores dropped even further from the two month post treatment. So uh, it's an extremely effective treatment for PTSD, especially if you use it in conjunction with cannabis. I know these are all like taboo sub subjects right here, but um, you know, we are pushing the envelope here in Colorado. We're leaders nationally in this. There are other drugs on uh, schedule one. Uh, Ibogaine, uh, it has a, a remarkable ability to completely cessate withdrawal from opium or opioids. So if somebody's out there and they're going to withdraw for, for heroin, you give them some ibogaine and it will completely halt that process and it will more than likely get them off the substance for good. 60% of patients report that they do. Um, so psychedelics really, um, they provide a completely new and disruptive technology for the medical and pharmaceutical model for mental health because they often only require a few applications before that, before that their benefits become permanent and, and then they last years, years and years with only a few applications. Um, ayahuasca is another, it's a South American jungle brew. It's made from a vine and a leaf and uh, it's also shown incredible anecdotal eff efficacy in PTSD. And uh, I just recently made a movie we put out last year called Soldiers of the Vine about ayahuasca therapy. It follows myself and six other veterans as we go down to Peru and uh, undertake the ritual. Like I said, anecdotally, uh, the results, the improvements were nothing short of amazing. So um, there's actually, uh, I'll be appearing in another film, uh, about three different treatments, cannabis, ayahuasca, and in MDMA. It'll be released this May at the Illuminate Film Festival in Sedona, Arizona. And, um, but that, the list doesn't end there. Uh, Toad, 5-methoxy uh, DMT, that's another very powerful medicine for treatment of PTSD. But the real thing I want to talk to you about is, is psilocybin, because you know, cannabis was the tip of the spear in changing the drug war, changing these drug laws. But the next in line on the docket is psilocybin. Uh, Colorado for psilocybin and Denver for psilocybin have filed a ballot initiative uh, in the city and county of Denver, and uh, that's actually active right now. Uh, we're trying to uh, get signatures so we can actually get it on the ballot to decriminalize the cultivation and the possession of mushrooms up to two ounces, I believe. And um, of course, there are some precedents. Uh, New Mexico Court of Appeals actually found that cultivation is not illegal in one of their cases. Uh, California has a statewide decriminalization, decriminalization effort. Um, hopefully it'll get decriminalized there, uh, although I would love for Colorado to be first. Um, and uh, of course the Denver, uh, city and county of Denver initiative is only for city and county of Denver, but it's a start, it's a, it's a move in the right direction. Peyote more than likely will we'll see some, some efforts to, to legalize that in order to treat these same issues. It, it acts on all the same receptor subsystems that all of these other medicines do, and it can also have great efficacy in PTSD. This is, this is the recipe for dismantling the drug war. It's our natural rights to stick a, a seed in the ground and watch it grow. There is no reality in which nature should be a crime. And nobody is free in America as long as nature is legal, period. So uh, I'll wrap it up there. Um, VNR, Veterans for Natural Rights. Uh, we want to end the drug war in its entirety. We want to end over-incarceration. 
and we want to stop civil asset forfeiture. Last year, actually, we passed a bill that um, was one of the first in the nations to uh, uh, limit the practice of civil asset forfeiture and, and get some accountability on it. Uh, and, and this year, we'll be tweaking the, the bill a little bit more. But we are leading right now, and good job, Colorado. Uh, I, I am proud to be a Coloradan now, and I'm proud to support all these efforts. Um, thank you. Your questions.